This session is called The Work of the Ministry. It's my final session into the school. I wasn't planning to do this session until a few days ago. I just felt the Lord was speaking to me that I must do it. So Nick and I swapped segments today. And um, so the work of the ministry and the... I want to begin and end with this scripture, Habakkuk 2, 14. Who can quote it with me? For the knowledge of the glory of the eternal one Yahweh will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. That's, that's the picture of the work of the ministry bringing a completeness. So the knowledge of the glory, the knowledge, say the knowledge, knowledge. the knowledge of the glory of Yahweh the eternal one will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. What does that sound like to you? A process. Yeah, for the waters to cover the earth even in Noah's natural flood, it took months for the waters, quite a long time for the waters to cover everything, to cover the earth, as they had been covering the sea up till then. And so that, that, that's our core scripture, that's our beginning, and that's our end. So the next scripture I want to give you is, is Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. God blessed the man and the woman. Hallelujah. And I just want to say this, I want to throw this out to the nations. The word for man, when, when God made man, is not referring to a male person in the Hebrew word. God made man, male and female, he created them in, that's verse 27 of Genesis 1 says that. So this man that God made was a corporate man, a male and a female, to begin the human race. Amen? So the, so the word for man is referring to the human race. So in the beginning, God made the human race. Male and female, he made them. Amen? And then, I want to go from there to Matthew 28, 19. Well, we'll, we'll go from 18 to 20. Rob will lead us. Jesus said to his disciples, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. You go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations every ethnic group baptizing them into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you and lo I am with you until the end of the world end of the age your Bible says but the King James says the world and so the world as it now is will not always remain it's coming to an end thank God for that this corrupt crazy world is coming to an end and one English poet said not with a bang but a whimper but we don't quite know how it's going to end there's going to be a fair bit of fire around hallelujah so God has given Australia and the whole world an amazing preview it's going to burn brothers and sisters it's going to be horrible all those who do not believe in God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ will be punished with eternal separation from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. It's a horrible future, but you better make sure you're in the ark of salvation. Amen? By the way, when, when that ark was being built and, and all the, the family and the animals went in there and the flood came, who was taken away? The wicked were taken away. They were taken out of the earth. They were destroyed from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power in that day that he sent the flood waters upon the earth and saved just eight people who were faithfully following him Amen Hallelujah So Jesus said as in the days of Noah so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man two will be in the field one will be taken one will be left which one will be taken? If it's as in the days of Noah, it's the wicked one. Now I've said enough now to upset people all over the world, but may the spirit of wisdom and revelation come upon you, so you just read what the Bible says and believe it. Not adopting some big fantastic doctrine and applying it to a little verse in the middle of Jesus talking about in the days of Noah, where he said, the wicked were taken away by the flood, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. Hallelujah. Amen. So that's my introduction. So 
So what is the work of the ministry? Question. On Wednesday we had the seven, ste the seven steps and on Thursday we had the, the six steps. And so you should have a fair idea now concerning the steps, yeah. So Janet asked me how many steps you're going to give today. Well, I couldn't quite, didn't quite have the time to organise some steps for you. But I want us to go to, uh, so, so what is, the, first of all, my question was, what is the work? Well, the work is to do the work of the ministry. Amen. And the work of the ministry, Rob taught us, really looks at seven steps. What was the first one again, Rob? Prayer. Prayer. The second step? Evangelism. Following people up out of your prayer. Approaching people out of your prayer. Which, which, which may mean going cold turkey to someone in the shopping centre, but mostly it doesn't. Mostly it means someone that you're in some relationship with or that God brings you in a relationship with in an obviously supernatural way. It may be the checkout lady. You know, when, when Nick was in some American city quite some years ago around Christmas time, he, he came to the checkout lady and, and said something about, Jesus and she said you don't, this is a supermarket you don't speak about Jesus in the supermarket he said why not I can love Jesus wherever I am can't I because she was trying to impose that you know no Jesus business on him but being a good Aussie he uh, didn't submit <laughs> hallelujah okay so what was the third step nurture, nurture. see that, that's a work you can ignore a new, a new Christian or even a newcomer to the to the fellowship, to the house church, to, to the discipleship class, you can ignore them, or you can reach out with nurturing in mind. If, if they still you know, show the signs of just still being young in Christ, not understanding too many things, you nurture them. What's the fourth step? Then if they're fair income, if, if they're serious, please, then you sit down and start to open up the word with them and show them the word, open up the word, show them the first principles of the word, show them the doctrines of the word, show them the seed from, from Genesis right through to Christ in Galatians, etc. What's the fifth step? We're talking about the work of the ministry. Training and equipping. Now again, in 19, beginning of 1985, for the, for the year before that, I've been serving basically as a bit of a glorified deacon. And uh, it was a bit of a rough year where I was sort of put down and, and you know, the proverbial was poured over me. And, but I survived through the grace of God and a couple of prophetic words I got through that process. And in January 85, we were at a conference in, in, um, in Brisbane. And the late Ern Baxter was our guest speaker and, you know, top level conference. And I was called up behind the curtain one day and I was told that we want you to become the leader of the church in Toowoomba. Like to become the senior pastor. So from the, from the dunghill, from the being a, a glorified deacon, or an unglorified deacon, sorry, Carl, unglorified deacon, suddenly I'm asked to be the leader of the church here, which is, I don't know, I can't remember many people. It was hundreds, two or three hundred. It's a Christian school. And that's all it was. I, agree. I said, well, do you agree? I said, okay. No laying on of hands, no commissioning, no equipping, no sending. Somehow or other, they decided they could trust me to do that work. And I worked very hard and, and did that work for three years. And then there was another inglorious casting on the dung heap. All for my good, of course. All for my training. Hallelujah. Yeah. So we give thanks for the tribulation. Hey, Rhoda, where is she? Yeah. We give thanks for the tribulation because the affliction of Yahweh brings us to the place where he wants us to submit and move into something more in him. Amen. Amen. Everything comes back to our relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. Step number six. Church planning. church planning. Get out there and plant the church. And step number. Well how do you plant the church? By going through the first five steps. Hey Rob. Yeah. One by one. Yeah. Begin with prayer. Then evangelism. Then nurture the new ones. To make sure they're baptized, fill up the Holy Spirit. And uh, what are the, what are the, so what, right in there, Nick, we need your six steps. What's your first one? First one was preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. Second one? Baptize, baptize those who believe. Third one? Teach. teach them. Fourth one? 
Bring them into the fellowship. Fifth one. Break, break the bread with them. And then number six. Teach them to pray. So they can become a praying person. And part of a praying community. Hallelujah. So we're talking about the work of the ministry. It's already been preached to you. But I want to put it together for you today. Yes, and number seven, six, seven. Back to you, Rob, number seven. Yeah, as we do that church planning and, and, and more, and the people that have gone through those steps start to do the work, what do you recognize? Ah, oh, an apostle. Ah, oh, a prophet. Ah, oh, a teacher. Ah, oh, a pastor. Ah, oh, an evangelist. We're looking for those evangelists. So if you want to volunteer, I mean, if you know that calling, let me know. Hallelujah. So let's go to Ephesians 5.11 again. Um, for a moment. So what are the five gifts mentioned in Ephesians 5.11? 4.11. Hold up your hand. Wiggle your thumb. And say apostle. Notice that he's the foundation. She is the foundation. The apostle is the foundation of your hand. You try and eat rice with your fingers without a thumb. Okay. What's the second one? The prophet points the way. Who, who uses your finger occasionally to point? Look, it's just over there. Over there, point. That's the prophet. Now you've got a long finger. Haven't got that long finger? Hadn't had it knocked off? Reach out. Reach out. What's that? Evangelist. And then some of you wear a ring finger. So that, that suggests the pastor looking after the family. And number five, put your finger in your ear and say, teacher, your little finger. Teacher gets in your ear to teach you the word. Amen. So we need those five ministries to do the work of the ministry. So verse, verse 12 is, is, is disputed by some and wrongly presented in modern Bibles, as so many things are. But the King James Bible presents verse 12 as, these five ministries are, are given for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ until. So let's deal with that. Because the modern versions say, equipping the saints for the works of service, comma, Building up the body of Christ. They take out one of the commas. It should read that the five ministries are given for the equipping or perfecting of the saints, comma, for the work of the ministry, comma, for the building up of the body of Christ. And we'll get back to that in a moment. So what's the work of the ministry? Well, in 1997, in September, I heard the Lord calling me in my heart to be an apostle. And then he confirmed that over the next three months in awful and wonderful ways. Now, as my wife would say, if I had been disobedient in September 1997 and said, Lord, I'm not interested in being an apostle. I enjoy being a teacher. I enjoy going around the, the nation doing seminars in many different churches. I'm making a living out of it, Lord. Thank you. I've, I've even got a team now I'm training. I don't want to be an apostle. I don't even know what that is. I want to stay being a teacher. I've just proven this ground. I feel comfortable here, eh, Rob? And if I had done that, what would have happened? Well, you wouldn't be here today for sure. But because I was able to be obedient by the grace of God, something's able to be built. Amen? So I started to apply myself to the work of the ministry. I'd already been working as a teacher for four years, clearly functioning in that, in that Christ-given gift. But now I had to learn the apostolic. I say to people, it took five years because I had no mentor, no one to guide me. I didn't know any other apostles. There's no books in the bookshop on apostles. I just had to keep on doing the work from house to house in Australia, overseas. Wonderful stories and times, but all of it I was, I was like an amateur. I was learning how to do the work of the ministry. In fact, I was telling someone the other day, it was in 1999 in, in Myanmar, Burma, when I was working with a local man who actually was an apostle, though he didn't really know it, and I learnt from him the pattern. The pattern is short-term ministry schools like we have here and then sending out. Three, six or twelve months later, another short-term training school, invite the same ones back, other ones will come, train them, send them out. That's why we're doing schools. Because I learnt that pattern in 1999 in Myanmar, Burma. And I came home and in June 1999, we had our first school for six weeks. We were beggars for punishment in those days, all day, sometimes into the night. We were doing the apostolic school. Amen. And then if we didn't learn from that, in year 2006, we had 18 international people here for 12 weeks. 
And uh, some of you will remember some things about that. In many ways, largely unfruitful, but all part of our training, amen, to become a fruitful, productive, apostolic ministry in the earth today. Hallelujah. So we had to learn to do the work of the ministry of the apostle. It was not enough, nowhere near enough, to just open a church and be like other churches in the city. In fact, we didn't open a church until nearly two and a half years after we began the ministry because our ch calling was not to have a local church, not, not like anything else we'd seen because in none of those churches had there been any apostles. I'd never heard anyone speak of apostles or say they'd met an apostle or we should have this one. We'd heard about prophets and prophets had come. Some of them were good value, some of them not so good. But we'd not had apostles. And to this day, most churches never see an apostle because their pastor, whoever it is, doesn't believe or won't accept apostles or is threatened by them. Whatever the reason is, they won't have them come in. So, so each of those ministries, those five ministries that now you know off by heart and you can teach others by using your fingers, they, they are the ones who need to do the work of the ministry. And that's what Ephesians 4.12 is talking about. These ministries are given by Christ in his ascension for the perfecting of the saints. We'll come back to that. Number two, for the work of the ministry. Number three, for the building up of the body of Christ until. Amen. Are you getting that? Amen. So if you need a, a correction, you know, I used to say it wrongly and, and the late brother Bill um, Evans came to me one day and said, Paul, you need to read the King James Bible. You're quoting it wrong. Those gifts... The work of the ministry is the work of the five pole. Bill had an apostolic background. And, um, and I took heed of Bill. I didn't argue with him. He was a senior man. In fact, he had his 77th birthday among us. And then he lived to be 90 among us. Hallelujah. And so he brought a correction to me in the very early days of my apostolic ministry. And he joined us here in 2001 when we got this building. And it was soon after that, or in that context, he, I think he'd made it before that. He'd made that correction with me when we were just using other people's facilities. Paul, look at Ephesians 4, 12 again. Look at it in the King James Bible because I believe that's more correct than the New King James or, and definitely than the NIV, etc. Because the New King James says, equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. Not, and so people only take two things out of that verse. There's three clear things. If the, if, the, if the ascension gift ministries, those who are appointed by Christ in, in one of those five ministries, if they don't do the work of the ministry, we've got problems in the church. The church will not grow up. The church will not be equipped, will not be brought to maturity, perfection. The church will not be made strong. And that's been the problem. In America, 20, 30 years ago, the attrition rate of people getting saved, quote, coming in the front door of the church and those going out the back door was about 20 to 25 percent went out the back door within a short period of time. You know what it is today? Over 70 percent that come in the front door go out the back door within a short period of time. Why? Because the churches generally are not doing the work of the ministry. There's nothing there for a 21st century person looking for truth, looking for reality, looking for the power of God, looking for whatever, and they walk into most churches and they won't find it. So they just stop attending. They go out the back door. Amen? And I believe it's the same in Australia. So how, how do you keep those young people? Oh, you get more and more radical, you have more and more smoking ceremonies, you have more and more dark, dark, black coloured upholstery and bl black all your windows out and paint it like a spaceship <laughs> whatever but guess what most young people are not fools after a while they think it's better down at the disco they've got better lights than this church I'll go back to the disco amen yeah I can get some grog down at the and drugs easily down at the disco a bit hard to get them in this church amen so the five ministries must do the work of the ministry. So what is the work of the ministry? Verse 12. The old version says, for the perfecting of the saints. The new version says, for the equipping of the saints. If you've got your, you got your real Bible there, your spirit-filled life Bible, New King James Version, you've got to be careful these days. The NIV have now got a spirit-filled life Bible out as well. So be careful when you go to the bookshop, you don't buy the wrong one. So, come on, keep with me. So, 
I've got enough distraction myself without you distracting me more. <laughs> what are we talking about, Cole? We're talking about the, the perfecting of the saints. But in your, in your real Bible, you've got a word wealth there, and it tells you what the Greek word is. And it's equipping, it's perfecting, it's doing this and that. But you know what the subline is? It's actually a reference in ancient Greek to a physician setting a broken bone. Oh. So the five ministries are to bring the church back into functional order. Alignment. alignment. That's the word. That's a modern word, isn't it? Are you in alignment with the will of God, my brethren? I mean, you know, a few years ago, the big word in the church was the paradigm. paradigm. You've got you to gotta get, a, get, a, get a new paradigm. Amen. So now we've got to get alignment. <laughs> so the work of the ministry is to, is to bring the saints into functional healing. You know, it, who knows if you've got a broken arm, you, a lot of things you can't do. And when you try to do them, you cause yourself a lot of pain, etc. Amen? You think that's a good description of the church today? Dysfunctional, broken, divided, at each other's throats, scared of each other. Hallelujah. You know, for years, I could count on less than one hand the number of ministers of the Toowoomba area who never stepped into Shiloh. But you know, a few months ago, we had 34 ministers here for lunch. God's opening a door for us at last. Hallelujah. Because I believe God can now entrust us with his holy word to, to share it faithfully with, with other ministers. Praise the living God. So, so the, the work is, is to build up, is to equip or perfect the saints. Bring them into functional order so they can function as members, as participants in the, in the body of Christ. And, and that happens at all times, but especially when we gather together. Home fellowship, house church, congregational meetings, prayer, prayer groups like we had today, prayer sessions. Whatever it is. Training schools, we can be participatory members because we're being equipped. What's the second thing? In, in, in doing the work of the ministry, it's to build up the body of Christ, to strengthen the church. Build up the body. It's a building term, but you know, in, in, in uh, Acts 14, Janet, verse 21, is it? Strengthening the souls of the saints, or verse 22. Paul and Barnabas, as, as young and new apostles, they were, they were preaching the gospel, they were making many disciples, they were, is it strengthening the next one? They were, they were strengthening the souls of the disciples, building up. So those apostles were busy doing the work of the ministry, strengthening the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith, amen? And faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes by the word of God. And so there's not much point in gathering in a house meeting and chit-chatting, saying a few praise songs and going home. That's not the purpose of the meeting of the church. The purpose of the meeting of the church is for the saints to be built up, to be strengthened, and that comes through the Word of God being shared, amen? Under the unction of the Holy Spirit. The Word with power. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And so we're to, we're to equip and to build up the brethren. Until, verse 13 of Ephesians 4, until what? We all come to the unity of the faith. We all come to a mature understanding and agreement. This is the word of God. Amen. You know, a, a lot of people you know, have a Bible. People love to have a Bible. And, and you know, I've recently read an awesome story about getting Bibles into underground places in China and other, other nations in Asia, into minority groups. And, and what a great work that is. And the brother who wrote the book had, had personally overseen the, the, the uh, giving out of 10 million Bibles. Hallelujah. That's awesome. But, but how do we bring the church to the unity of faith? Because everybody, 10 million people can read the Bible and come up with a different idea. That's not the unity of the faith. Amen. So we need the five ministries. And especially apostles and prophets, because Ephesians 3 verse 5 says that God has given to his holy apostles and prophets the revelation of the mystery. Amen. So we especially need apostles and prophets. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 20 says that, the, coming from verse 19, the household of God, having been built upon the foundation of apostles and prophets, 
Christ Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone. So the churches everywhere are still missing that vital foundational ministries of apostles and prophets. But you know, I noticed on the Facebook yesterday there's some conference coming up in Sydney and they invited a few from around Australia who are professing apostles and prophets. And I hope that's good. I hope they handle the word of God well. I hope they are mature. I hope they are effective and even more effective as time goes on in this nation because we need apostles and prophets to raise up. To bring the church to the unity of the faith. What's the faith? That which we believe. It's what Jude is referring to in, in verse 3 when he says, I was going to write to you about our salvation, but because of what's going on, I have to write to you and exhort you to contend earnestly for the faith once and for all delivered to the saints. You know, we've, we've had the joy of having two dear brethren in our home for the last two weeks and we've had some, some pretty mm, weighty, weighty experiences in the word together because we're still coming to the unity of the faith and it's just amazing the warfare that can go on even among friends coming to the unity of the faith because so many people all over the world once they've grown up a bit in Christ and nobody's nurtured them and nobody's offering them discipleship so what do they do? They develop their own doctrine They've got no choice. They go on internet. They go here, they go there, they hear of some group, they hear of some ministry, off they go and they imbibe it. So they start to believe wrong things. And they can say, but look, it's written, it's written. <laughs> but it's not. It's not what you're saying it is. Because you're not knowing how to read the Bible, of how to interpret the Bible. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm not going to go into that now. It's not a theology class. But we, but we must come to the unity of the faith, that which we believe. The faith in that context is like Jesus saying in John 6, is it? My doctrine is not my own. It, it, John 7. It's the doctrine of my Father. That's the faith. That's the faith. Amen? You know, if you went out in this town now, there's, no, there's no, more than 90 churches meet, meet each week in this, town, in this city. I'd wonder... Pastor David Truss is not here one day, but I'd love him to go and ask all these pastors. In what name do you baptise? And they'd look quizzing, what do you mean? What name do I baptise? I baptise exactly how Jesus told us to. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Yeah, what name is that? What are you talking about? I'm asking you, what name? What's the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost? <laughs> oh, mate, are you a Jesus only person? I don't want to talk to you. Get out of here. I'm talking about the unity of the faith. Even people who believe in baptism by immersion, who even believe it's a necessary part of our foundational experience of Christ, still will argue with you about the name. And you say to them, but look at what Peter said in Acts 2.38, and look what it says in, in Acts 8.16, and look what Paul says in, in Acts 19, verse 5 and 6. Oh yeah, but I'm not going to change. That may be so, but I'm not changing. I had a dear minister say to me one day, I went through all the scriptures with him. He said, yeah. Another minister, I, I was in a foreign t a town somewhere, and he said, oh, I've got a baptism for you to do, Paul. Is that okay? I said, yeah. By the time we came to Sunday, that was Friday, we had 27 people wanting baptism. So I said to the minister, I said, what name do you baptise in? He said, what do you mean? Oh, I, I, I share with him the scriptures. He said, doesn't really matter, does it? I said, I can't believe you said that. You're a, you call yourself a teacher of the word. And you just said it doesn't matter what the scripture says. Come on, mate, you need a reform. So anyway, guess who was first in the water that Sunday afternoon? The pastor, followed by 26 others. Isn't that awesome? So they all got baptised in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hey. One more story on baptism. I was in Kenya back in the early days. In fact, it was my first time there and I was the speaker in a big conference and guess what I preached on Rob no try again come on no come on the foundations of our faith Hebrews 6 1 and 2 and, and I only got four done because I got held up at number three what's number three 
And I just happened to say, in, as I was preaching, how many here have never been baptised? Hands went up everywhere. I said to the bishop, when can we have a baptism? I put him on the spot from the, from the platform. And he said, oh, Saturday morning, I guess. Saturday morning, because the conference is fitting for it. So I said, this, the bishop just said there's going to be a baptism on Saturday morning. Come along to be baptised. And so one of the bishop's overseers was, was going to be, he was taking me to the baptism. And I said, just forget his name. I said, uh, by the way, what name do you baptise in? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, the Bible says to baptise in the name of Jesus. Oh, he said, we can't do that. That's what the cults do. So we can't obey the word of God because the cults baptise in the name of Jesus. We've got to stick with the formula in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You know, because I'm an ex-Catholic, you've got to say that in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I mean, I can't even do it well. The Anglicans have their own tone as well. Yeah, Nick can probably imitate all of them. But, but no, no, it's not that formula. It's in the name. Or it, it, and you know, literally in the Greek, it's into the name. There's no in there. It's into. So we're going to be immersed into this name. Anyway, and what am I preaching that for, Nick? Unity of the faith. Yeah, I'm on the unity of the faith. What happened and, when that? What happened? Where? In Kenya, I just said the name of Jesus over everybody. He might have said another bit, but I said the name of Jesus, and I baptized 60, 69 people that day. Yep, including one pastor. <laughs> Baptism is such a such a measuring rod, such a plumb line to hold up against the church, even against pastors, because some of them haven't been baptized. They've been sprinkled as babies, whatever. Okay, so praise God. So. Yes. Well, the next one is the knowledge of the Son of God. Who here can, can agree with me that, and if you're older in the law, that in years past you really had no idea what that was about? You, we all believe Jesus, Son of God. On the day I got born again, the young minister said to me, do you believe Jesus, Son of God? Yep. I believed that. I didn't have any reason not to believe it. I had no idea what it meant. I knew it was a title of great importance, and I, I just... Because the two weeks before, in the first church meeting of true Christians ever been to, I'd got a conviction that, the, that Jesus is Lord. Because I'd been into Buddhism, Hinduism, all many lords there. But on that day, I knew that Jesus was Lord. So when the man asked me, do you believe that Jesus Christ is Son of God? Yeah, I believe. Do you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins? Man, I said, I believe. So we prayed together. Ask Jesus to forgive my sins and ask him to come into my life. Hallelujah. End of story? No, beginning of story. Because he did. 45 and a half years ago. How about that? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, the knowledge of the Son of God. From about 2006, I attended a conference in, in Florida, USA, and I heard a man preach on Christ from the book of Acts chapter 2 transformed me came home preaching Christ and within a short time preaching the Son of God and by the second half of 2007 opening up the mystery of godliness so to understand the knowledge of the Son of God you need to know 1 Timothy 3.16 for without controversy great is the mystery of godliness God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the nations, believed on in the world, received up into glory. And Nicholas and I got birthed into that together, travelling on that big round the world trip, and ever since we've been preaching it. The number of times I've preached on the mystery of godliness, wonderful. And guess what? I'd still preach on it with just a, a greater level of excitement today Amen. than ever before. Amen. The knowledge of the Son of God. Amen. Who is Jesus? You know, there's been a huge attack for centuries, building up until now, to deny the divinity of Jesus Christ. Do you hear that? Yep. There's, a, there's an unspoken sort of movement to dethrone and defrock Jesus Christ. To not believe in His divinity. He's only some sort of a man, as special as that may be. No, Jesus Christ 
is the Son of God. And if you understand sonship, if you understand the biblical view of sonship, the Jewish view of sonship, you will know that if you're a son of somebody, that means you finally are the same as the one you're the son of. And you carry the Father's name. So Jesus was able to say to Philip in John 14, If you have seen me, Philip, you have seen the Father, the knowledge of the Son of God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I don't mind dying for the knowledge of the Son of God. I'm sad that the, that the founders of the Anglican Church died for not believing in the transubstantiation myth of the Catholic Church, which they were required to believe in as bishops of the Roman Catholic Church. And at least two or three of those great men of God said, no, we cannot agree with that. We just agree with what the Bible says. Jesus said, this is my body, this is my bloody. He didn't say that when the ordained priest says some words over it, it suddenly becomes the actual flesh and blood of Jesus. Just defies all imagination. But those men had to be burnt at the stake for refusing to accept that, that idiocy. Are you with me? Yes. So there are some good foundations in the Anglican Church. They did have good doctrine in those Reformation days. But where were we? The knowledge of the Son of God. Yes, and some of you may have to join me in laying your life down for the knowledge of the Son of God. Of, of telling people that Jesus Christ is God. It's, it's a terrible doctrine. It's a scary doctrine because it, it pulls the rug out of every other doctrine, of every other ideology, of every other demonic practice. The knowledge of the Son of God. Doing the work of the ministry until we all come to a perfect man. Hallelujah. And, and, and I've got Habakkuk 2.14 there again against the knowledge of the Son of God. What's Habakkuk 2.14 say? That the knowledge of the glory of Yahweh will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. So why have I put that note with the knowledge of the Son of God? Because the knowledge of the glory of Yahweh is revealed to us as we come to the knowledge of the Son of God who Jesus is. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. 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 To a perfect man, to a mature corporate body, fitted and joined together in Christ. That's the work of the ministry, is, is to bring, is to bring the, the saints the, to a perfect man, a mature corporate body, properly founded, properly <laughs> discipled, properly taught. Amen? And so how do we bring the saints to that perfect man? Well, verses, verses onwards now we're going in verse, in verse um, 14, it says, by bringing the, the believers up from being children who are following after every wind of doctrine, that, 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 that the believers should no longer be babes, being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine and the cunning craftiness of deceitful scheming and the trickery of men. You know, a lot of ministers, unfortunately, are tricksters. A lot of ministers are, uh, what do I say? The cunning, they're cunning and they're crafty. You know, Benny Hinn and others convince people to send me a $1,000 and I'll pray for you and it'll be a $1,000 prayer. If you only send me a hundred dollars, I'll still pray for you, but it'll only be a hundred dollar prayer. And we've heard we've heard ministers in in, in uh, Kenya offering the same thing. Who wants a seven thousand shilling prayer tonight? Who wants a two thousand shilling when when the sevens and the fives ran out? Who wants a two thousand shilling prayer tonight? Janet was witness to it in a youth camp led by an illustrious bishop. And that's how they become illustrious through cunning craftiness and deceitful scheming and the trickery of men. They're mainly after your money. They're not after your souls. They're not wanting to bring you up into the knowledge of the Son of God under a perfect man because then they will lose their position. You know, there's coming a day when there's no more, no more ministry gifts functioning because we're all functioning fully in Christ. Amen. Amen? There's no more bishops or overseers. No more deacons or ministers. We're all ministers. We're all deacons. We're all doing the work. That's the goal. A perfect man. So we're bringing the saints away from the winds of doctrine. What does Hebrews 39 talk it? 
not being led astray by various and strange doctrines. And we included in that the other day the doctrines of food. Be careful of them. Amen. Hallelujah. Then verse 15 says that the work of the ministry is to bring the saints up to be able to speak the truth in love. That's a challenge, isn't it? We can all speak the truth in a little bit of agitation. You know, those, those JWs that came to my house the other day, I heard in Janet's voice and in my voice, we were a bit agitated. You know, how dare you come onto our property preaching this, this denial? You know, we were not quite speaking the truth in love. We didn't feel to invite them in for a cup of tea, but the Bible says not to do that anyway, so I wouldn't. But, but I could have been more friendly. I, I, I could have been more winsome in my ways. But they are so, it's such an affrontery to me to have people coming with Bibles and wanting to, wanting to deceive and, and control and cajole people into believing their terrible doctrine. Amen? So, but we're to speak the truth in love. Growing up in all things or in all aspects into Christ. So we're meant to be growing up. This is the work of the ministry. You know, the, the Nick and, and Rob presentations were wonderful, powerful. But, but don't, lose the, don't lose the big picture. That we're to, we're to grow up in all things into Christ. That's why we follow those seven steps. That's why we follow those six steps. That's the work of the ministry. To bring the believers up in, into the knowledge of the Son of God under a perfect man. To no longer be children. Be able to speak the truth in love. And to grow up in all things. In all aspects. Into Christ who is the head. And then verse 16 talks about that body now released the function in agape love that's the goal we're all treating each other so well because we've been we've been immersed in that love we've come to the end of ourselves we're no longer full of ambition and and wanting to do this and you know do that and have my turn no we're growing up into a functioning community praise the lord so now we're going to Colossians. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, just before we go there, who remembers 1 John 2, 12 to 14? Rob? What's it all about? So it's all about growing up. You're not to remain as children. You're not even to remain as young men and women doing the work of the ministry, boasting about your testimony. Oh, I got this one saved. Oh, I cast out that devil. Oh, I saw the sick healed. Aren't I great? Hallelujah. I am a mighty minister of Christ. No, you're not. You're just an upstart. So learn to quieten down and just get on with doing the work, learning more and more of the doctrine so you become mature. Because the goal is for the knowledge of the glory of Yahweh to cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. You know, when Yahweh became a man, his name is Jesus. In Philippians chapter 2, from verse 5 to 10, has it? To 10, you have the awesome picture of God humbling himself, of God emptying himself, of God becoming of no reputation, being found in the likeness, coming in the likeness of men and being found in the appearance of a man. You know, if you want to get your, get your role model, it's Jesus. Please don't look for any others. Go for Jesus. And please don't give your kids a, a Superman toy to play with. Give them a Superman Jesus to play with. Somehow or other, train your kids to realise the greatest Superman that ever was and will be and will, is Jesus. He's real. And, and so teach little children real things. And be careful about letting them watch TV. Because I don't know of any programs on tea that'll teach your children real things. They'll fill them with lies and deceptions and witchcraft. Even early in the morning. So 1 John 2, 12 to 14 says that there's meant to be a growth from being little children who are newly saved. They know their sins are forgiven. They've come to know the Father to grow up to be young men who are strong because the Word of God abides in them and they have victory over the wicked one. But that's not the goal. We've got to keep growing until we become fathers. Until fathers are those who can father children and bring them up. Amen? See, a lot of ministers seem to be in the ministry for kicks, for reward, for claim, for fame, for satisfaction. No. You're in the ministry to grow by all the, all the hard kicks you get and the knocks. 
you know, I say to people, if, if you've survived in ministry in the church for 20 years, you're, you're one of a few, because most get rubbed out by the church as ministers. Because we don't, we don't bring our ministers up, we don't train them, we don't look after them. We show them out there, and if they succeed, oh, the famous Rob Cochran. If they, if they don't succeed, the infamous Rob Cochran. Who wants to remember him? Where to grow up to become? Fathers. Fathers are mature ones. And the key thing about fathers is they can bring up sons. They can nurture. They can actually beget sons. So Paul says in the little book of Philemon, if you might give me the verse, Janet, but he's speaking of sending Onesimus, the runaway slave, back to his master. And he calls Onesimus, my son, whom I've begot in my chains. Verse, it is verse 10 of, of Philemon. And so fathers can beget sons, isn't that awesome? Paul's held in a prison house somewhere. Onesimus, at the risk of his life, runs away from being a slave. He could have been killed by anybody anywhere for being a runaway slave. Same thing happened in North America when there's runaway slaves. Anybody had license to shoot those slaves. And if they protected them, they could get into serious trouble. Because the slaves were able to go up north where there was, where there was freedom for the, for the Negro people. And, but, if, but if anyone gave them, um, you know, protected them, hit sanctuary, they could, be, they could be charged. And anyone up north even still had the right to just get the gun out and shoot them. Because they had no rights as human beings. But what am I talking about? And Nisimus was a runaway slave. And it seems like he stole some money of Paul's to catch the boat across to Rome where Paul was in prison. Because Paul even says to him, if he owes you anything, put it on my account. See, that's the father. Covers the sins of his sons. In a right way. Because he says, this Nisimus, I'm sending you, him to you as my own heart. What an amazing statement. Paul was saying, when this young man comes home, um, Philemon, receive him, not as a runaway slave, coming back in repentance, but receive him as my own heart. And then Paul says in verse 10, whom I begot in my chains, my son Onesimus. So for Paul, he's no longer a slave in any measure, he's a son. Receive him as you would receive me in verse 17. Hallelujah. So, bringing people up, doing the work of the ministry, Rob. Hallelujah, according to 1 John 2, 12 to 14. From milk to solid food, Hebrews 5, 12 and 13. Restoring the restoration of Christ as the head and the restoration of a functioning community. We had a scripture earlier today of the, of the times of restoration from Acts chapter 3. Hallelujah. So now we're going to Colossians chapter 1, the work of the ministry. And so you, if Nick was, he can probably put some points in here, but I haven't got them numbered yet. We can do that when we're editing the manual. But we're starting in verse 24 of Colossians 1. Paul says, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. Without going into it, I suggest to you that those who heard Rhoda speak yesterday will now understand that verse 24 a bit better. Okay? I'm just going to leave it there. Now verse 25, Paul says, Of which? Of the church? I became a minister of the church according to the stewardship from God which was given to me for you to fulfil the word of God. So, so the ministry... If you're called to be a minister, it's a, it's a stewardship from God. Amen. Amen? I never, I mean I did. The day I got born again, I, I knew I, was, I wanted to be and I knew I would be a preacher. When I, when I yielded my life to Jesus, when I asked Jesus to come into my life, I knew that that was it. That was everything. I'd been searching for him for a while. I'd, I'd been through thick and thin. I'd had a lot of bad experiences. Been searching in wrong ways, wrong places. So when, when Jesus came into my life and I was born again, I knew from that moment I would be a preacher. And 45 years later, I'm still preaching. And I intend to get to, I'd like to get to 85, Cole, like, like Mr. Methodist did, John Wesley. 
John Wesley used to ride horses from one appointment to the next. And often he'd preach three times a day, six o'clock, 12 o'clock and six o'clock at night. And that would mean riding from one place to the next. So he got a little, little thing put on his saddle where he could put his little Bible so he could be studying as he went along. The horses knew where to go, the Holy Spirit led them. And, uh, and at, 80, at the age of 80, his, his fellow brethren said, John, whether you agree or not, you're not riding a horse again. We're providing a little chase for you. That's a special little buggy. So for the last five years of his ministry, he went in a buggy from place to place. Amen? Amen. I was awestruck by that testimony. Yeah. And I've often said to God, if I could still be preaching at 85, I'd be happy. Yeah. Amen? Amen. But, but this young fellow challenged me at home the other night. He said, in 10 years, Paul, you'll have reached how many nations? Half, the Half the world, he reckons. So I'm here for until I'm 78 at least, okay? If you want to hang around with me, we've got a lot of nations to reach, men and women. He's told me, I believe the word through him. Amen. Amen. I've been inspired by it. Hallelujah. Because I'm thinking, you know, 70 is only two years away, maybe. No, not thinking about it anymore. 78. And then 85. If the Lord tarries. Amen. Where are we up to? We're, we're, we're in Colossians 1, 25. I'm talking about there's a grace, a dispensation of grace, Paul calls it in Ephesians 3, verse 2 or 3, that he received a special dispensation, or in Colossians he calls it a stewardship. What's a steward? Well, well in, in the old days in England, probably still in some of the estates, the, the family live up in London and the, and the husband's a member of parliament or whatever he's doing up there, and every so often he goes home into the country for a break. But there's a steward there looking after his property. So there's a steward there ruling over other servants. Amen? So that, that the idea of a steward is, is rich in, in the British English history anyway. So if you understand that, a steward is someone who's looking after taking personal responsibility for his master's property and running it exactly as his master wants it run, being fully accountable, handling the finances honourably, etc. So so we, we as ministers have received a, a dispensation of grace. It's a stewardship. We've been appointed. So Paul says in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 4, 1, that you should receive us as stewards. Which comes first? Servants of Christ, that is ministers of Christ, and stewards of the ministry. So we are the... What did I say? Oh, sorry. So we are the two in one. We are servants or ministers of Christ and we are stewards of the mysteries. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is a, this is a holy calling. Amen. And so Paul says in Colossians 1.25 that according to the stewardship from God which was given to him for us, the church, the, the, the church in the nations, to fulfill the word of God. So what's Paul's call? It's to fulfill the word of God. It's a ministry of the word. And so these five ministries that are due to the work of the ministry, they're all ministries of the word. The evangelist mainly preaches the word. The pastor shares the word. The teacher teaches the word. The prophet prophesies the word. And the apostle brings a revelation and establishment of the word. Amen. So, verse 27 He's, verse 26, he's to make known this mystery, which was hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. So what is the work of the ministry? To get every saint receiving the revelation of the mystery. You know, there's many different ways we can put it, but it's like when you come to Shiloh, or you meet us in the nations, many of you can remember there was a point when something just clicked over, and you started to get revelation. Hallelujah. Praise God for that. Because that means I'm doing the work of the ministry properly. Because I'm making known the mysteries. And in such a way that you get revelation. And so you come to know the mystery. Because when you come to know the mysteries, you start to live in a different realm. Amen. You start to live in the high places. You have, he gives you the feet of hinds. So you don't slip on, on the craggy rocks. But you can ascend into the high places with the Lord God. Hallelujah and have a personal, intimate understanding of his glory, of his purpose. Amen? 
Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2.7 that, that, that these, this hidden wisdom, this, these mysteries were given to us. They were ordained before the ages for our glory. So the work of the ministry is to bring all the saints into the knowledge of the mystery. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I've still got a bit of time left, so don't tune out on me now. Let's get excited about these mysteries. And so verse 27 then summarises this great mystery. To the saints, God willed. God willed? You expect God will change his mind? No, he was already willed. He's willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So if it's in the Old Testament, we put S-E-L-A-H there, Selah. Stop and think about this. Just stop and think about it. Don't read on. Look at it and get the impact of it and say, my God, we've got something yet to happen for us to know that Christ is living in us, the hope of glory. And so what's the work of the ministry? Verse 28 sets out a few things for us. In verse 28, first of all, we are to, step number one, Nicholas, preach the gospel. We are to, no, we're, to, we're to preach Christ in this context. Step number two, we're to warn every man. That's male and female. Step number three, we are to teach every man and woman. Hallelujah. Step number four, with all wisdom. This is the work of the ministry. And, what, and, and how do we reach the goal? So that we, when we may present every man, male and female, perfect, fully mature, fully equipped in Christ Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? So then Paul says, to this end, I also labour. In other words, I do the work of the ministry. Striving. Striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. Hallelujah. There is an anointing available. It, it's, this, it's, this, it's this working of God. It, it's the word en energia. There's a wide wealth right there for you. Working, action, operative power. The word, English word energy comes from this word. Amen. And our power company here in Toowoomba is called Ergon. It's from the Greek word, energy. Producing energy. Hallelujah. So we're working to do the work. In, Matthew, in Acts 6.4, what did Peter say about the ministry? He said, we apostles will not leave the ministry. The ministry of the word of prayer and the ministry of the word. He said, we'll appoint some others now, some deacons, to do that practical work. But we apostles must commit ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. So what's the primary ministry? Prayer. No. The ministry of the word. It, it comes out, of, it's backed up with prayer, comes out of prayer, but it's the ministry of the word. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So we thank God for all the translators of the Bible, because long before I ever met another Christian, I could start, well actually I did meet another Christian, and then I started to read the Bible. I already had one, but I'd never read it. And I started to read the Bible, and the Bible spoke to me. I wasn't a praying man. I was still a meditating man until I took the Bible in there one day and then I stopped being a meditating man after that because the Bible told me about false prophets and honestly I couldn't sleep that night and I knew it was because of all those false prophet books I had in my house I had a wood fire in my house, a wood stove so I got all my yoga and Buddhist books and burnt them then I could go to sleep I was not a Christian so the word, the ministry of the word my brethren hallelujah the word, speak the word so, Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, what's he say? Timothy, that which you have received from me among many witnesses, you now impart to faithful men and women who will teach others also. Hallelujah. You know, the thing I've discovered lately is the word used for man and men, often in the New Testament, is the Greek word anthropos. And it doesn't primarily mean male or female. It means humankind. So we are to teach all men. That means all the human race, men and women. Amen?
Don't leave half them out. Hallelujah. So we are, so the ministry of the word, we'd impart to faithful men who will teach others. So what's the work of the ministry, Nicholas? It's the work of discipleship. What's, how's the work of the ministry go forward? By having church in the house. You'll, you'll make a lot more progress in the work of the ministry if you minister in small groups in houses where people are normal. <laughs> where, where they don't put on a front to come out to the church meeting. Amen? It's an every member ministry. Learning, every member learning to minister. So in conclusion, I say to you today, plan to do the work of the ministry. You might say, well, I don't know whether I'm an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, or a teacher, or just a Mr. Nobody. That's okay. Be a Mr. or Mrs. Nobody and get about doing the work of the ministry. Why? Because the grace of God is available for you and I to do the work of the ministry. Amen? Amen? And honestly, when you get to the coal face, it doesn't really matter what your ministry is. It's the reality of what's in front of you. A person that you need to speak to concerning Christ and his word. And so you draw on the grace of God. You draw on the power of the Holy Spirit. So these are my final instructions. Plan to do the work of the ministry. Remember the first works. So have we got a brochure on the first works? I think we need one. So we've got four there. What are the four first works? There'll be four points on this new brochure. Number one. In Apostles' Doctrine. Fellowship. Breaking of bread and prayers. So, remember the first works. Do them. And then you'll be in love with Jesus. And everyone comes into your home, will pick it up. As we do these things, as if they are our own normal lifestyle. So you don't put on a little religious breaking of bread at home. Do it in reality, in truth. Genuinely remembering Jesus. So that if someone's visiting your home, they'll experience Jesus. And if they're not yet a Christian, when you offer them a Lord's table, you explain to them what it is to be a Christian. You explain how Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Do you believe this? Yeah? Okay. You can have the Lord's table. You've heard us tell stories of, of bringing people to the Lord at the Lord's table in recent years because we've practiced it, we've ministered it in reality. So when Paul says, what does Paul say? Uh, test, examine yourselves and, and then eat and drink. So Janet was leading the Lord's table in Kasumu, Kenya. And she said, and she showed them the test in 2 Corinthians 13 verse. Come on, come on disciples, where are you? Are you doing these things? So you, you tell people, so she said to people, you know, we need to all now just stop and examine our hearts. Is Jesus Christ in you? And if you can say yes, then you've passed the test. And so they were handing out the bread and the cup and this young man said to the servers, I, I didn't pass the test. I don't know Jesus Christ. So well, there's a bit of a kerfuffle going on. We said, what's happening? This young man didn't pass the test. He's never asked Jesus into his life. Oh, that's easy. We said to our host minister, lead this young man to Christ. So he did. And then what happened? He took the communion. Hello? 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 I haven't got time for any more stories. But plan to do these things. A couple of years ago, I remember Janet and I just saying, you know, we're not going to change what we do when visitors come, particularly family. We're just going to invite them to join us. So, at different times, two of my daughters have come and we've just said to them, after the meal, they were staying with us for the night, after the meal we, we read the scriptures together and, and we break bread. Would you like to join us? Yeah, okay. So they sat and read the scriptures and they took the Lord's table. And then some in-laws of Janet, of mine came, Janet's family, and for the first time they're going to stay the night and, and over washing up, Janet said, well, after we finish the washing up, we're, we're going to be reading the scriptures. Would you like to join us? Yeah. And we're going to break bread together. Is that okay? Yeah. And, and we had a fellowship at a deeper level with that dear couple than we've ever had before. And it led to me showing him 
the vagaries of the NIV and he was absolutely shocked, he was almost angry. But they've taken scriptures out of the Bible? How dare they? You know, he's a, he's, he's a sort of a full-on guy, this brother-in-law of hers, and he was ready to do them in, you know? Imagine taking scriptures out of the Bible! So I went and got him a new King James off the shelf and said, here's my Christmas present, brother. It was a spirit for light Bible. Apparently he really loves it. So don't, don't change what you do for visitors. Use it. They're the people God's given you to witness to. Amen? If they hate you and curse you and leave the house, they will good riddance to you. You know? But do these things as if they are your normal lifestyle then others can be reached. So what do we do? We read scriptures. We study scriptures. Often our, our reading ends up into a study then. Because Hillary will have some deep question that we have to answer. Or the brother will have some little question to answer. And so it leads to Bible study. What else do you do in your homes? You exhort people. You pray with people. You break bread with people. You share meals with people. You discuss strategy with people of how to reach others. Amen? Amen? So, and that strategy comes out of prayer and the word. So my brethren, stay on target. Habakkuk 2, 14. For the knowledge of the glory of the eternal one will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. God bless you in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen.